welcome back there. Um, this morning, we had a fascinating session on how research-intensive universities embraced inclusion with a focus on particularly undergraduate, but also master's and PhD students. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome you to this session, which is really about taking it to university leadership there. One of the things that all our students say to us is, um, where is the person who understands me in the senior management team? Where is the person whose experience resonates with my experience there? How can they create a curriculum that makes sense to me and for my success unless there is someone who genuinely really understands and has been through the kinds of experiences that I have? whether that's in terms of gender, ethnicity, religion, sexuality, or socioeconomic background. So to discuss diversity in leadership, I'm delighted to be joined by Hannah al Nuaym, Dean of Women's Campuses at King Abdulaziz University in Saudi Arabia. Shi Chen, President of South University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen in China. <coughs> Raj Kumar, the founding vice chancellor of Jindal Global University in India, and Nirmala Rao, vice chancellor of Asian University for Women in Bangladesh, all of whom come with very different perspectives on this issue of diversity and leadership, but an absolutely common commitment to ensuring that diversity and leadership delivers great outcomes for high quality research and a high quality student experience there. Each of them is going to speak for about five minutes about their own institution and their personal experiences there. I'm then going to ask them to respond to each other before turning to you in the audience there. But first, another quick straw poll for you here. Who in the audience has a 50-50 senior leadership team, male, female? That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Who is satisfied with the diversity in all aspects of their senior leadership team? There are two people here, three, four. And it would be particularly helpful to hear from you about what your diversity constitutes and how you feel you achieved that. Because as the blurb for this session suggests, it implies actually that this is a continuing problem that we haven't yet managed to crack. But we have here four institutional leaders who have new organizations, new universities, and they've been able to do things quite differently, often from the very beginning, or are just starting to achieve that there. So Hannah, can I ask you to start? Um, hello, everyone. Um, really honored to be among the distinguished guests today and listening to all the leaders of the prestigious universities yesterday. Uh, I realized that we all have a common goal. It's really how to achieve this goal that's different. And it's different because the environment, the circumstances of each university is different. Uh, like all of you, our university is quite large. It's actually maybe the second or third largest in the Middle East. Uh, we have nearly 60, around 70% female student body, so we have our own challenges. The biggest challenge the university faces as a whole that many universities don't uh, face is that we're a government university. That means while other leadership try to strive for funding and recruit uh, the best and the brightest, we actually are funded by the government. We have our own private means. Uh, but the major funding is from the government. Uh, we are uh, full to capacity. In fact, there's pressure to accept sometimes double, even triple the amount we can uh, accommodate. So we don't have to go out there and attract students. They're actually, we're overloaded and overwhelmed with the, um, uh, the number of students. Um, add to that that we have to adhere to rules, regulations of multiple ministries, uh, bureaucracy, and uh, we have to respect religious and traditional uh, norms. Uh, we have to uh, be sensitive to uh, parent expectations. And on top of all that, as women, because we are on segregated campuses, 
uh, we have to deal with our own issues locally. Uh, we are one of 30 government universities, one of which is only female, Princess Nora, and another is only male. The rest, which is the normal universities, are co-ed. In our situation, we're actually on the same main campus, although we females, we have an additional six campuses. So it's my job to make sure that everything is running smoothly. Uh, I represent the president in all of the events and all of the uh, committee meetings. But we have our own challenges to deal with. And it's really difficult for any male leadership, which is traditionally, they are the decision makers, to run campuses that are segregated that they cannot see or nor interact with. Therefore, they had to really depend on female leadership to run the show. They really need boots on the ground, or in this case, maybe heels on the ground to run the show. Uh, and how we did that, because we're in the same campus, it was really easier for us at KAU because we had to sort of replicate uh, and coordinate and integrate every college, a deanship and small unit. From the smallest units of administration, we had to replicate. And there's a leader on both sides, and they have to coordinate at every level. So they're running specifically the female part, but at the same time coordinating to make sure we're always growing together as one university. And we have done that successfully. Uh, most of our services, administrative services and academic services are all electronic. This helps distance not be an issue, uh, even for me, because I have also vice deans in the other campuses running the show there. Uh, so with all of these challenges also, uh, we are overwhelmed because the students, the female students are by far uh, outperforming the males. Uh, their expectations are extremely high. Their demands are enormous. Uh, their use of social media sometimes is, uh, is let's say, uh, naughty, because sometimes they would try to get out of an exam and there was some, some, something on Twitter that makes everybody panic. So we had to learn to deal with crisis. We had floods in the, in the campus and we were all females. We had to do so many things by ourselves and we learned a lot. But at the same time, it taught us so much. Uh, we have become an incubator for leadership for the, for the country. In fact, uh, the 30 female elected uh, for the highest council in the country, most of them, in fact, with the exception of two or three, come from a university environment. So the university actually helped create leaders for the country. And for us women, we have to juggle family, we have to juggle you know, being social, we, are, we, are, we have large families, we have to be social. So juggling all of this really helped us become stronger women. And let me just end with, with one comment. I'm always asked, even in the most high level intellectual meetings, you women in Saudi Arabia don't drive. And it's like the only thing that's of interest to anybody. Uh, I know most of the women in London probably don't drive, and in New York they don't drive. I drive when I'm outside the kingdom. A lot of us who studied abroad learned to drive and still drive outside the kingdom. Yes, we don't drive in the kingdom, but believe me, that's not what defines us. We, were, we learned to cope by not driving because we have public transport and we have Uber-like companies and we have private transportation. We learned to cope. And because we cope with that and we cope with all the challenges, it made us stronger women. So don't think about what we can't drive. We were able to drive our universities to international recognition. So I think Saudi women deserve respect more than not being able to drive. Thank you. Thank you very much. She, an incubator for leadership. Oh, How do you do this? Oh, thank you, Evelyn. And uh, the gender diversity has never been a problem for China because we have famous quote from Chairman Mao, women can hold up the half of the sky. In fact, in China, we do better than that. Our vice prime minister in charge of education is a woman. China's first Nobel Prize laureate, the only one, is a woman. If you think about the most Chinese, most famous sports team, is Chinese women valuable? And even more than that, for my university, our party secretary is a woman. If you know China, you will know that normally the party secretary is the number one person. I am the number two person. So for us being a university of science technology, our university, the women student and men student ratio is about one to three which is consistent with our faculty. We are making effort to improve it. So in my understanding, 
What does leadership diversity mean to us? I think it's inclusion for all people to participate in our public affairs. That's the first one. Second one, I think that diversity is key to your success. I learned this from one professor, Nobel Prize uh, laureate from Stanford. One time he visited us. I asked him, what's the secret of success story for Stanford? He thought about it. He said, it's diversity and culture creation. So I believe in all of this. So to Sustack, diversity and leadership define who we are and where our strength is. Sustag is located in Shenzhen. I'm not quite sure everyone has been to Shenzhen, but Shenzhen is a great city. It's a new city, it's China's the economic reform role model. It's very successful. If you, you don't know Shenzhen, you probably know Huawei. Huawei is the largest the company in terms of non-state owned for China, located in Shenzhen. Another company is called Tencent like US Facebook, which has, you know how many users every day? 900 million. Facebook, I was told, 300 million people. So I talk to my assistant. I don't call them anymore. I just send them messages through WeChat. So Shenzhen has been called the China's Silicon Valley, in fact, by Business Week. And the China's Shenzhen GDP is the number one per capita in China. And also, China, the Shenzhen has been the heart for, you know, this called the Guangdong, Macau, and Hong Kong, the Bay Area, which is about the same GDP like New York, twice as Los Angeles Bay. So Shenzhen was a small fishing village 37 years ago, about 50 million people. Today, the city has 20 million. The so average age for the city it's very young, 33 years old. So people, about 16 to 17 million people <coughs> attract to Shenzhen because it's a, it's a diversity, because it's open attitude, coast, location, air quality, and the great opportunity. So diversity is a key we recognize for the city development. Sustag was created in the cradle of Shenzhen and fully supported by municipal government. It is first research intensive university in Shenzhen with a mission to serve the sustainable development of the city and to become a world-class research university. We only have eight years, so THU will not rank in us. But the last year, Nation Index ranked us. We were the number three fastest developing university in the world last year. For three ex ex consecutive years, for last three years, we were ranked number 55, 44, 31, among 2,600 Chinese universities. We recruited students from about 22 provinces, nine countries. So different from almost all Chinese universities, we don't just judge them and admit a student by their Gaokao, that's like SAT scores. We judge them by five factors, ensure the diversity. So we include the SAT, Chinese SAT. We test them out by ourselves. We interview them, we look at their high school performance, and so on and so forth, to ensure diversity. All our faculty, are from outside of Shenzhen. More than 90% of our faculty are recruited from abroad. We use English as official language in classroom and in campus activities. All our faculties, including leadership, myself, we serve in the residential college as advisors. So we learn from Oxford and Cambridge. So you just, uh, the, the host just asked question. How many university has more than half the leadership of women? We don't have that women the leaders. But of the 12 university leaders, half are foreign passport holders. So six from China, six from other countries. So I think 
the in international background of the leaders greatly enhanced the global recruitment capability of the university. All our department chairmen and deans, they are mature scientists that we recruit all over the world. The background diversity of SUSTEC people bring with them the knowledge about excellent universities in different ecosystems. They know how things can be done in multiple different ways. They don't ac accept status quo so easily. So SUSTEC is the most exciting project for me. I returned to China 13 years ago from John Hopkins University. So I appreciate the opportunity to share my passion with you guys. I sincerely welcome you uh, to visit our university in Shenzhen. More importantly, next year, February 5th to 7th, we will host the THE Asian University Summit. We look forward to seeing you in Shenzhen. Thank you. <laughs> Very good to get that invitation in. Wonderful. <coughs> good morning to you. That's a hard act to follow. Um, well, let me, let, me, let me just start with by saying that uh, as academics, we should be very conscious of uh, looking at diversity from the standpoint of quotas and tokenism that diversity ends up becoming represented in universities. So it's, we are, of course, very conscious of the fact that we need to promote diversity and reflect the diversity in leadership positions in our own institutions, and we uh, actively promote that. But I think diversity is also about the kind of inclusive culture that we talked about in the previous session. It's, uh, for a country like India, uh, diversity is not a public policy priority. It is a constitutional value. It is part of our civilizational heritage. Uh, it's a subcontinent in which Historically, uh, people from all kinds of religions, castes, uh, languages, and other forms of persuasions have lived together. And that is reflected deeply embedded in our institutional imaginations across our universities as well as higher education institutions. Uh, the fact remains that with over 1.3 billion people uh, in India, uh, while it has over 80% of uh, uh, people who have Hinduism as a religion, uh, it also has over 120 million Muslims and also Christians and uh, Jains and Parsis and many other religious persuasions. Uh, in some ways, this aspect of diversity is also reflected in the institutional cultures that are embedded across Indian universities. OP Jindal Global University was founded with a vision to uh, transform the higher education landscape in India. It was a, it's a private university created through a philanthropic initiative of our founding chancellor, Mr. Jindal. And the vision from the very beginning was to challenge the existing status quo of higher education institutions. India has a large higher education sector with over 800 universities universities and uh, over 50,000 colleges, and most of these institutions have had significant challenges towards promoting the kind of diversity that we are talking about. And so when OP Jindal Global University was created, a conscious effort was made to be able to build an institution which reflects the global diversity that it aspires to achieve. So we were the first and only Indian university in the last several decades to be able to recruit full-time faculty members from around the world. Just when we began in the year 2009, we began with that mission to be able to have faculty members from around the world as a part of our institutional culture. And today we have over 300 full-time faculty members of which over 20% of them are non-Indian nationals recruited from over 20 different countries in the world who have relocated to India and are working at our university. So that's one critical aspect of diversity we began to promote. Second, it was important for us to be able to promote gender diversity in academic engagement. And across the world, we have a huge challenge. Uh, we know that the American Council on Education's report has consistently reflected the fact that even in a country like the United States, which has significant efforts to promote diversity, as of today, nearly 80% of academics in higher education institutions are white and male. And that's the kind of challenge of diversity we are seeking. At OP Jindal Global University, we have over 45% of our faculty members are women, and the rest, 55%, are 
faculty members who come from different states of India and around the world. The Another aspect of diversity which is less talked about in these forums, which is also equally important, is the kind of disciplinary diversity that academic institutions ought to promote. I think it is fair to say that the growth and evolution of a university will significantly depend upon the kind of changes that take place in the leadership with regard to the disciplines that the leadership comes from. It, it, it has to be mentioned that if the president of a university is a nanotechnologist or a, a, a nuclear scientist as opposed to a historian or a political scientist or an anthropologist, many aspects of what the university does will also be shaped by it. As a university which is deeply committed to the study of humanities, social sciences and professional schools, our diversity of our leadership team reflects the kind of emphasis that we have given to the disciplinary diversity that ought to be promoted in academic institutions. And the last, which is important for us in relation to the kind of social and economic backgrounds from which our faculty members and our leadership team comes from, we are very fortunate that we have been able to bring together the values and principles that, the, that shape the founding of the institution to the leadership team, and that is reflected in the work that they do. So in some ways, for us, the diversity in leadership is not just a public policy imperative. It is part of our core constitutional value that is reflected in every institution's imagination. We are fortunate that at a, as, a, as a relatively new university, which is only eight years old, we are able to uh, reflect that in pretty much everything that we do, from faculty recruitment to assessment to be able to appoint institutional leaders across different departments, we bring in the aspect of diversity and is deeply embedded into our human resources policies and our assessment of the work that our faculty members and staff do. So in some ways, we are part of an effort to transform the landscape of higher education. Two years ago, we had the privilege of hosting the BRICS and Emerging Economies Times Higher Education Summit uh, at our university. And we are indeed looking forward to the opportunity to engage with the world at large. And as I mentioned, I believe that the democratic values that India as a nation stand for, the pluralistic vision and diversity that is deeply embedded in the constitutional values that India has promoted is not only important for India, but for the world at large, as today we are a far more fragmented world than we were before. And it is these values that <coughs> India as a nation, universities such as ours, are promoting are important for the future of higher education. Thank you. Raj, thank you. <clears throat> Nirmala, diversity in incubator for leadership, you're a relatively new vice chancellor, a remarkable institution. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, I'll also touch upon, uh, make a comment, if I may, on uh, what my colleague Raj has um, said about uh, diversity. But I'll just stick with the gender diversity. I I'd like to offer my reflections uh, based on my experience of having um, served in two very different sociocultural traditions, the India and Bangladesh on one hand, and the British system where I've served for nearly a decade at the level of Deputy Vice Chancellor at two London institutions. Uh, for me, this particular summit is um, a, a, a wonderful reminder of the adv advancements we've made um, in gender equality since I was a girl growing up in India when it was perfectly fine to pay women less than men for the same work or to fire women for being pregnant. Uh, but since then, uh, the move has been in the positive direction. Uh, but when it comes to giving women financial freedom and economic opportunities, I must say India still scores pretty dismally. And women are rather poorly overall underrepresented in top uh, employment and leadership positions. With only, uh, in the professoriate, only 1.4% are women, only 3% uh, are vice chancellors, just to give you an example. And even on the gender wage um, disparity, India scores um, very poorly. It's got one of the worst levels of gender a disparity with gaps exceeding 30%. 95% of Indian women are in informal sector, 60% in the lowest wage earners, uh, only 15% in the top category, and compared with a global average of 40% participation in the wage earners group, India only contributes 20%. Now, in terms of Bangladesh, 
it's very heartening to see that in the last decade, they have actually made uh, fantastic um, strides in um, economic growth over the last decade and is gradually moving towards middle income status. However, despite significant um, improvements in uh, women's positions in, in leadership, and the prime minister, the foreign minister, uh, the empowerment of women ha is still missing in, in its real sense uh, because of issues of domestic violence, the patriarchal norms, or um, uh, discrimination, which limits women's opportunities in gainfully being, being gainfully employed or uh, in seizing opportunities. So what's being done to prepare women to break out of this cycle, both in India and in Bangladesh? Uh, Asian University for Women, where I've been for the last six months, was set up with the intention to um, provide women drawn from various parts of Asia, uh, coming from very diverse socioeconomic uh, backgrounds and language uh, backgrounds, with opportunities to come together in a single women-centered space, to come together to think and critically reflect, both individually and collectively, what their roles are, what the value systems, and how they might actually shape the economic and social structures that impede their advancement and their potential. The concept was not novel when it was established in 2008 because uh, Japan, India, Pakistan, um, South Korea had women's universities, but uh, AUW was different. Different in the sense that it was not meant to mimic and imprint upon the student the prevailing social ethos about the status of women. Rather, it was uh, meant to provide, as I said, the space for women from different backgrounds to come together and reflect on their own roles in an environment which was much more supportive. The idea that they can take refuge in a safe envi in environment, in a safe space, express themselves and learn. When the charter was presented in, to the parliament, there were significant opposition from the radical left and the Islamic conservative forces, the radical right, while accepting the concept of a single all-female institution, was vehemently opposed to the concept of the liberal arts education and the fact that we were building a nexus of international partnerships and the kind of investment that was being drawn from Gates Foundation, MacArthur, Goldman Sachs, and so on. However, at the end of the day, the practical aspects uh, eclipsed the ideological, and it soon came to be accepted that without such an institution, access to higher education for women in the region would be impossible. It also gave us a wonderful uh, platform to go to the donors to convince them that their funding would be targeted strategically for the benefic benefit of women. There wouldn't be any spillage and it would give the best outcomes. And such a university would also eliminate all kinds of biases and create a framework for, that would support women. And finally, a safe env environment where women could come together, learn and socialize. If you recall, those were the years in early 2000s when there were a series of political violence in universities in Bangladesh. Some of the universities in uh, Pakistan uh, were providing military training. Major generals were vice chancellors. And in some universities in Africa, there were incidents of sexual harassment. So the concept of an all-female university in Bangladesh was clearly justified in terms of providing that safe haven. We are all, of course, familiar with the advantages of having female, all-female universities, um, 39 of them uh, in the US, uh, in terms of promoting empowerment and opportunities. Um, we also know that their relevance is being outmoded, not just in the UK, but in the West, generally, because of the strides we've made in gender equality. However, my experience at AUW, albeit brief, I have to say, um, that for those coming through the pipeline, all female campuses provide role models, they provide fantastic opportunities to grow strong leaders, they provide opportunities to build confidence, self-esteem, self-confidence, and, and, um, and it's con very conducive to building the self-esteem which women, I think, need. And in regions where gender inequality still remains an issue, in the Asian subcontinent, for example, these universities are a must because I, I, I personally think both per professionally, personally, and academically, there's no match for, the, for these universities. Uh, how different is AUW to other uh, female universities, both in India and Korea? 
We are um, different in three, three ways. One is the diversity. Nowhere in the region is there another university that brings together students from 15 different countries speaking over 35 languages. We have students coming from almost 85% of our students are first generation university entrants. We have students coming, refugees from Myanmar and Syria. We have former garment factory workers from Bangladesh. We have um, uh, students from Afghanistan, 20% of them. And we have students from all the other war affected areas of Yemen, Palestine, Syria, um, Iraq. So we have a diversity. Diversity and empowerment is our strength. Uh, second, this is the only liberal arts university in the region, all female, which offers a very different kind of content in terms of the science and technology content, which is much more enhanced than any liberal uh, university, but liberal college, liberal arts college in the States. It is enhanced because we recognize the role of science and technology in transformation of societies, and we believe that um, this would not only make students more proficient in um, um, technical aspects, but it will also, they will also experience independence through the physical act of using, using for example, ICTs and creating socioeconomic gains. And in the third, the third respect we are very different is the methods. Nowhere in the Asian subcontinent do we have any university, I'm sure Raj might correct me on this, but I don't believe there are universities that have small group teaching. Uh, we are particularly keen that we maintain that so that there is discussion that is interactive. We encourage individuality, we encourage questioning, we encourage um, independent thought, uh, critical reasoning, inquiry. And uh, that's all I have to say about the difference in terms of what we offer in other liberal arts colleges, both in the West and in the rest of the region. I just want to conclude by saying, even if AUW, we are only in the 10th year, even if we are wildly successful, it is still a very small institution. And the larger change will only come about when society actually recognizes the value of women, the contribution they make, and they're prepared to promote women um, in various fields. And in that context, we are now in the process of setting up a global commission on the status of women in higher education. Uh, which I hope I can look to you for input uh, at some point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I um, just now move and ask each of the speakers to very briefly reflect on what they've heard, but also say something about what you personally have had to model um, as a leader to encourage an inclusive culture on your campus? Hannah. Uh, part of the issues I, uh, I heard my colleagues talk about is about um, equal pay. Uh, in our situations, the rules on, on the books have been equal. It, it has no gender. It's not gender specific at all. So we've had equal pay since the, the creation of the pay scale. Uh, the rules regulating academic promotions, hiring, firing are the same. So in, in higher education, there's absolutely no gender-related differences between male and female uh, at all. So in, in this regard, uh, we've had uh, the same privileges, the same opportunities, um, so that was good. Uh, in terms of class size, of course, we all know that we prefer to have smaller class sizes, but with the, the pressure to accept you know, twice or triple your capacity, we end up trying to, we cannot just have large class sizes. And this is part of the challenges we had to face. We don't want to just increase, allow students to come in, because this was decreased the quality of the interaction. So we had to find different methods of uh, trying to incorporate the numbers, but at the same time, keep the quality high. And this is by extending the workday. Even though last year we had the financial crisis and we couldn't pay overtime, still we had to do it. We had to extend the, uh, the class days, uh, two to three hours more. Uh, we had to share resources between, um, uh, between colleges. Uh, we also share resources with our ma uh, male counterparts. We share buildings, we share uh, facilities. So we had to come up with a sort of crisis management, try to deal with uh, what we had to face, but at the same time, never ever sacrificing quality. Uh, if you talk about me personally, I try, as a, as a leader, to uh, uh, 
you know, put myself in the position of being a, a mentor and a model. For example, I never stop teaching. Even though I'm very busy and I'm in charge of multiple campuses, I never stop teaching. I wanted to show everybody that, you know, I'm part of the system. I wanted to be part of this. I want to have access to students. I want to go through what every faculty goes through to know what they're going through when they talk to me. So in that regard, I'm, I'm truly proud of myself that I never left teaching. I supervise maybe... Uh, 11 uh, master's students, I supervise four PhD students, all in the time frame I have been this busy. Uh, and to me, being a leader means you really have to be uh, a model, what you know, you have to you know, talk the talk, but also walk the walk. And I think that helped a lot look up to me and say, you know, she's not just telling us to do something, she's actually doing it herself. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Sustec is a U newly established university, we are aimed to, to, to become a world-class research university. So for us to adopt, to follow the international stance, it's very important. In so terms of gender pay. Agenda and pay, and uh, the job, and the recruiting, and students, and the faculty. So but diversity not only includes gender, also includes many other aspects. You know, the regions, we try to recruit all the faculty, regardless of your, your gender, and also regardless of where you're from. So that's what we call the global university. Uh, we hope ourselves can become a global university, be accepted by the international community. So we are going to, to work with you to follow international standard, the value of the world society. Because we are new, it's relatively easy for us to do. In, in Chinese, that would say task will be made easier if a man and woman work together. That's another joke. It's true. Also, that brings a different kind of perspective that diversity can bring into it will help us be more from the innovation point of view. They can bring different perspectives. We are quite uh, good in doing this, except to bring that uh, women in engineering, women in science, not an easy job, especially for China. Uh, probably I, I came from the United States. Even we tried very hard for engineering school. Sometimes it's not that easy. So we are still working on it. But diversity, also in the leadership, we like SUSTAC. We invite all the people in the world. We include the faculty in the leadership, the vice president, and the assistant to president, and the assistant vice president, and so on and so forth. If they are from Canada, United States, Europe, Australia, and so on and so forth. So that really brings a different perspective, making my job as a president easier because they bring different arguments to the leadership teams. They make its things work much easier. So I think our experience is that diversity is not only a moral requirement, it's key to our success. It's key to success of the city of Shenzhen, it's key to success of our university. Ross, do you want to make any comments on some of the points that Nirmala has raised about how you may be striving for inclusion, but India, in terms of pay gaps and um, the experience of women, is actually a challenging environment? I share uh, Nirmala's uh, concerns and also the aspects about the long journey that India is undertaking with regard to addressing some of the very core issues relating to the status of women. Uh, I think it is fair to say that given the normative framework and constitutional imperatives that have been put in place, this aspect of addressing the role of women in positions of leadership, as well as uh, promoting equality and a sense of uh, empowerment is ought to be a key framework for our future of our governance. Uh, you know, it's very interesting that while there have been significant strides in a certain aspect of political representation of leadership among women in India, it continues to be a major challenge when it comes to the kind of aspects of wider representation in, uh, particularly in universities. Uh, we have had uh, both 
a prime minister and a president in India who happen to be women. In fact, Pre Prime Minister Thatcher and Prime Minister Gandhi, uh, Indira Gandhi, studied at Somerville College, Oxford. Uh, we've had uh, uh, judges of the Supreme Court who have, who have been women. We right now have both the Indian Defense Minister and India's Foreign Minister who happen to be women. But I do believe that these representative frameworks of looking at gender could only take us to a certain distance. The most important aspect of what we need to look at in diversity is the culture of diversity that we are building within institutions. And I believe that OP Jindal Global University is fostering that culture in which we promote all forms of diversity. Now, of course, there is a natural tendency for us to look at certain types of diversity when we are in this forum, and gender becomes a very important framework of it. But I would like to say that we need to look at many other forms of diversity. And as we think about the future, uh, you mentioned about the personal anecdotal experiences that I want to share with. One of the things that comes with uh, uh, building a new university from scratch is the possibility of shaping its future by our current priorities that we set for ourselves. So when we established OP Jindal Global University in 2009, we pitched ourselves as a global university from day one. And when you call yourself as a global university, the first thing you begin to do is to be able to recognize that the faculty that will represent this university ought to be global. So while we have recruited and we have full-time faculty members from 20 different countries in the world, it not only reflects the countries such as United States and UK and France and Germany, whose faculty members are there in our university, but also we have full-time faculty members from China, from Bulgaria, from, from parts of Africa and Middle East and Latin America, from, from uh, Russia. So that type of diversity in our faculty recruitment has become a part of an institutional vision which we believe is critical for promoting diversity in leadership. Even in the context of building our collaborative endeavors, it ought to be not only confined to certain countries which inevitably become priorities for institutional collaborations, we need to build a more diversified collaborative framework, and that is why our university has collaborations with over 45 countries around the world. In a way, diversity for us is not only a framework of institution building, but it ought to be the future of governance of universities. No, I'm look briefly before we go to the audience. Yeah. And thank you, Raj. I'm glad you mentioned the appointment of Defence Secretary Nirmala Sitaraman, with whom I would studied right through my university days from the age of um, uh, 19. And I was very pleased to see her announcement. She's the first female. Of course, Indira Gandhi held that as an additional portfolio when she was Prime Minister, but Nirmala Sitaraman is the first woman Defence Secretary. And minister. Uh, minister, sorry. And... Um, holding the cabinet rank. Uh, now that raises big questions as to how the three uh, chiefs of Army, Naval and Air Force are going to uh, respond to that appointment. Um, but going back to Bangladesh, uh, your question was what would I do in terms of changing or in terms of the future? Uh, of course I've been there only six months and it would be unwise for me to change anything for the sake of changing. Uh, I must say the top leadership team is 50-50. Um, although we only recruit women students, the faculty is predominantly male faculty and from North America, 60% from uh, North America. I'd like to redress that balance and build capacity by recruiting many more local Bangladeshi academics who are trained abroad, but they return to their home countries. Uh, so that's about faculty recruitment. In terms of students, we have about 25% of our students in top universities of Columbia, Harvard, Stanford, uh, Oxford. And we have our four uh, PhD students coming out of Stanford this year. And these are students from very remote tribal areas we recruited eight years ago. So I'd like to bring them back, give them teaching positions and build capacity for our students. That's a priority. Yeah. So, You've all been really quite positive from your own personal and institutional perspectives, and in particular because you've stretched the notion of diversity from specific characteristics to being the sense of global, international diversity within your own communities there. Um, the statistics, of course, tell us something a little more challenging, 
there. And so I'd like to open it up and invite the audience both to comment on their own perspectives, um, but also to ask questions there. So we've got roving microphones. Are there points that people would like to make at this stage? No. Yes, thank you very much. It is a very enlightened presentation. And now... Could you introduce yourself, please, sir? Yeah. Thank you very much. It is a very enlightening presentation. But I have some question still. <laughs> yeah, 50 years ago, I came from the Asian University, which is in Chittagong. Probably, can you just let us know why you need to recruit academic staff from North America? Uh, you are the vice chancellor of Asian University for Women. And are you building capacity for Bangladeshi women to become the faculty member? Is there any project or any strategy? Yes. Um, your first question as to why we have 60% of faculty drawn from North America. The liberal arts education that we model Let upon. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. yes. What is the percentage of female? I know that. I look at it to about 180 universities in Bangladesh. And probably very negligible, even not one person, your faculty member, lecturer or professor. And how is Bangladesh? Do you have any strategy advising Bangladeshi government to recruit more female academic staff? Mm -hmm. I can only speak for my university here, that's right. Um, yes, you're right. I mean, we have about 60% from North America. These are young academics, passionate about the region. They're also passionate about uh, women and um, their position. And we have some very good recruits from Yale and Columbia. And they come here for two years. They do research. It's research-informed teaching, cutting edge of the discipline. And we do want that. We want a good balance between the international and the local, partly because our curriculum is modeled in the Chicago liberal arts tradition. So we do need, at least in the initial years, um, faculty from North America to help train the local uh, uh, faculty that we are intending to recruit. We have 40% who are Bangladeshis, but by, by origin, they're Bangladeshi, but they are again trained abroad and they come back. So Bangladesh is a very unique um, country, quite uh, different to India in that there's a growing intelligence here. People going abroad, training, getting their training, getting their doctorates, and coming back to the country in the way that you don't experience that in India. And we are finding that pool of um, academics from whom we can draw. In Dhaka, for example, all the research institutes, whether it's... Um, the um, ICDDR or schools of public policy, they're all s stacked with people who are trained abroad. So there is plenty of um, pool from which to draw. And my strategy would be to increase the number of female faculty. And we do have quite a number of female faculty in AUW. I can't speak for other universities in Bangladesh. But um, yes, I mean. Local capacity building. Yes. Yeah. And, and eventually, even. Even the top leadership, I would like to see the local Bangladeshi take over at some point in the next two or three years. Uh, I, uh, you know, we have um, our dean who is from Southampton, and she studied in Stamford. I'm an Indian, and I would like to see myself giving back to, to, to Bangladesh at some point. Raj. I want to quickly respond to the fact that sometimes we tend to uh, become pretty nationalistic about the fact that, you know, we, we, we are constantly straddling between two, you know, contradictory imaginations. At one level, we want to be global, and we want to accept the fact that with global, it comes with all kinds of responsibilities. At another level, we quickly want to say that, oh, you know, ultimately, it needs to be manned by people locally. And I think that's something which... We, yeah, yeah, well, all, so in some ways... <laughs> In some ways, I think we need to become far more responsible about the kind of vision and imagination as an institution. Because when you call yourselves global, it comes with certain responsibilities. And that means to be able to reflect that full 
gamut of diversity. It could be people from somebody from anywhere. anywhere. In fact, uh, we just completed the process of recruiting the dean of our newest school, the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. We recruited Tom Goldstein, who used to be the dean of the Columbia School of Journalism and the Berkeley School of Journalism. He relocated to India. Now, at that time, we were thinking, we didn't, we didn't go out to recruit uh, Tom Goldstein, but we felt that that was the person who will best reflect the future vision of our school of journalism. And I say this to bring home the point that as institutional leaders, we need to be conscious of how our vision and our mission reflects the ideologies and the ideals <coughs> that we want to promote. Thank you. Uh, now, before I turn to you, I'm just going to ask Laura for a comment. Thank you, Evelyn, and thank you, panel. It's um, a very interesting discussion. My name's Laura Poole Warren, and I'm from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And um, I'm in the very privileged position of being one of the about 30% of women who are on our leadership team. So, so we have roughly 30% women on the larger executive team rather than the smaller management board. When you actually look at our professoriate, we drop down to about 20% women. That's far too low. And I think one of the things that we have embedded within our strategy is the fact that we need to be driving towards 50-50. And I have picked up from some of our panel members that we're sort of talking more about um, the importance of cultural inclusion and, and somewhat putting gender into the background. And I think we have to be very careful that we don't turn this into an either or situation, mm -hmm. that we need to be making sure we're embedding cultural diversity. But if we're not representing 50% of the population, the women, then I think we're not doing our jobs. Mm -hmm. So I, I would really, it's really a comment, but I'd be very happy to hear from the panel on their thoughts. Before we do that, let's see if there are any further comments. Mm -hmm. uh, Georgia Nugent, I'm the president emerita of two liberal arts colleges uh, in the States, and also the chair emerita of an organization that prepares women for leadership in higher education. And uh, so I'm coming from that, from that uh, context. It seemed to me uh, several of our uh, panelists mentioned a legal framework or a constitutional framework as guaranteeing certain rights or privileges or representation. And I just think it's so important that we check that against what's happening on the ground. I think, Evelyn, you alluded to the statistics. And we have an interesting version of this that we experience currently in the states where in recent years, several very high profile universities, whether Harvard, Pennsylvania, we won't go there, uh, <laughs> uh, Brown University, the uh, Michigan uh, University of Michigan and so forth, all had female leadership, which gives them very high profile. But in fact, the percentage of female presidents has remained at about 20% for more than 25 years. It hasn't budged. So I think we have to constantly be checking the statistical reality, the reality on the ground, even though establishing the principles is also an important part. Thank you for those two comments. Are there any other quick comments that people would like to, to make? Mm -hmm. Maria de Klein, I'm the head of analytical services to Elsevier. We brought out a report a couple of months ago about uh, gender in the global research landscape. And one of the findings there is that women researchers tend, their articles are downloaded more and cited less often. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, uh, that's one of the key ways in which we see uh, often research performance, in which we look towards promotion. What can institutions who don't have a very diverse leadership now do to better recognize the women scholars? Thank you, those are really important points. And I, and I think the challenge in some ways for all of you who are trying to establish global institutions is if North America and perhaps Oxford and Cambridge are your models there, despite the small number of examples of female senior leadership in those areas there, they're not necessarily 
the most institutionally structured to promote diversity there. So what do we do to actually challenge ourselves in terms of new formulations there? So some very specific questions and some very broad challenges. Hannah, if we just finish off now, we've got about five minutes, so perhaps if each of you take a minute or two to reflect on what you've heard. Uh, if, uh, if you heard the speech yesterday by uh, the president of NYU, when he said that they have uh, different campuses, he doesn't like the word branches or satellite campuses, uh, different campuses in uh, 11 different countries. And he said that although they have people running those campuses, that they have to follow strict guidelines and it follows through uh, the, the NYU main, main offices. I think it's the same with us. Just because we are female on different campus, we're actually another campus, just like any other uh, prestigious university with a, with a, a distant campus. Uh, the challenge is, is to run the day-to-day day -day work, but at the same time, make sure that you are in coordination with your, your mother campus or your main campus, and make sure that the growth of the university and the globalization of the university and the accomplishments of the university is one. And I think that was our challenge. How can we be autonomous? Because we have a, a, a separate culture for the females, but at the same time, be on a daily basis, uh, we work with our male counterparts. And, and I think in, in our case, it, in KAU, it worked successfully. I'm not going to say it worked in all of the kingdom successfully, because although the rules on the books, as I said, have nothing to do with the gender, it, it ends up being an attitude. If the attitude of your executive male counterparts are good and you are strong and resilient and highly motivated, it's going to work well, and this is the situation we have at KAU. Other universities, the attitude of both may be different and they did not accomplish what we have accomplished. So again, it's not really related to the culture or religion or uh, what's on the books, it sometimes comes down to attitude. Attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, that uh, the diversity in leadership, uh, the issue for the whole world, is still a difficult task. I just listened to 20% for the United States, and uh, even uh, bigger challenges for China. And I don't think a Chinese, the, the presence and high uh, level uh, leaders, we already reach that stand. I think this is an issue of tradition and culture and also the policy. So I think if you can share with us some of your experiences, how to promote diversity. I, I truly believe diversity, not only because, as I say, moral requirement, also it's the key to our future. But I think for whole China, we, are, we have not done yet. We are still on the way to achieve that. But awareness of this issue to the society, to higher education, it's the beginning. I strongly believe that uh, we need to work towards promoting diversity in leadership at all levels. And I entirely agree with the comments made by many of you here with regard to the fact that this just cannot be uh, seen as a broader effort to promote other forms of cultural and uh, diversity within the campus. Gender diversity in terms of its priority, we need to draw inspiration from our own values and principles. And I entirely agree with the chair that while we position ourselves as a global university, but when we looked at the faculty at Harvard and Yale and Stanford and Oxford, it, did, it didn't reflect our own values. And hence, we had to evolve our own values and principles. And today, when I look at our faculty, over 45% of our full-time professors are women. And that's a conscious effort to build that outstanding leadership within the institution. But when it comes to our administration, we have around 30% women and we want to work harder to create that diversity. But I do have hope that when I look at our student community, over 45% happen to be women. And I do believe that these students and graduates of our university and other hopefully similar institutions are going to make that change. So in some ways, as leaders and institution builders, we need to promote diversity in leadership, not only as a policy priority, but as a core institutional value, which if it means we need to draw our own destinies and not necessarily draw inspiration from others, we should do it. 
Uh, of the 180 or 90 universities in Bangladesh, there are only two that are classified as international, and AUW is one of them. We don't depend on government, we are not on private university, but we are international in that we are highly dependent on um, donors, trusts, and foundations from abroad. Uh, I have no problem in maintaining, we would like to keep a balance of overseas faculty, uh, but also build capacity locally. And the reason I say that is Bangladesh is different to India, for example, in the particular geopolitical context that it, it, it's located and the cultural challenges and the political sensitivities uh, I'm aware of. So while building leadership, I want to make sure that the local um, uh, capacity is fully uh, developed Thank and uh, we draw from the local pool. Thank you. Well, thank you to my panellists. So I can vividly remember still over 30 years ago when I was an undergraduate in the United States and fighting for women's studies and black studies and minority and ethnic representation in my institution, being told that it was simply a question of time. I'd grow up, the world would be different, there'd be lots of me coming through that pipeline, lots of diversity would suddenly miraculously emerge as we all matured. I very much hope that my granddaughter is not still sitting here in 30 years time having this same conversation there. To ensure that, I think as Hannah and others have said, it very much depends on our individual and collective action there. Not simply stretching the problem to one that's impossible, but one that where every action we take every day makes a difference. So thank you to the audience. Thanks to the Times Higher. Can you all please be back here at one o'clock for the exciting unveiling of the Times Higher World Rankings? I know you can't wait. Thank you very much. Thank you.